Okay, my name is Christian Kerbel. I'm a professor of impact research in planetary geology at the University of Vienna. And as has been mentioned just now, uh, since 2010, also director general of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. My research deals mainly with impact craters, meteorites, and topics like that. I'd like to tell you a little bit about impact craters. Uh, I have to do without the fancy uh, music and videos that uh, we just saw. Uh, I'll try to dazzle you with content. Um, because an impact would be over very fast anyway, and then you know, we wouldn't see anything anymore. Um, so we're going to talk about craters, mainly on Earth, but I also want to introduce the solar system. The importance of impact cratering in the solar system in general is very obvious by looking at the surfaces of these planets. And we see that impact craters are very abundant, kind of, wherever we're looking. The study of impact craters on Earth is the only place where we can do ground truthing. We can investigate impact craters more or less in three dimensions. We can go to the outcrops as geologists and look at the different rocks, uh, what they are, how they have formed, and so on. Um, and we can relate 3D measurements, seismic measurements, gravity measurements, other geophysical measurements with the actual study of the rocks, which is very important, as we will learn a little bit later. Now, uh, impact craters and impact processes have been very important in the history of the Earth. For example, at the beginning of the Earth, uh, the Earth and other planets were made by collisions that uh, more or less are large-scale impacts. So the growth of the planets dates back to a period of intense bombardment. The early Earth and the early planets were all subjected to very intense bombardment early on, and that lasted for hundreds of millions of years, and therefore there is quite obviously a connection to early life on Earth. Was early life fostered by impacts? Did some of the uh, organic materials that uh, were necessary for the uh, formation of life, did they come from impacts? Did impacts create warm oases on a cool planet early on? Or did impacts, in fact, sterilize the planet? I think the truth is in all of it, and we have to just separate things apart. Also, we know that in the history of the Earth, impacts have played a major role, and there are some impacts, one for sure that we know of, that had very devastating consequences for the uh, history of life on Earth in terms of mass extinctions. And then something that geoscientists are quite interested in, because of the dynamics of impacts that uplift material from deeper crust levels to the surface, this allows us to access material that would otherwise be many kilometers down, and therefore people who are interested in the Earth crust are also interested in studying impact structures. Now, if you want to study impact craters on Earth, and you want to know how many impacts actually occur, uh, the best place to start and to look is actually the Moon, our n closest companion in space. The reason is because the Moon sits there and takes it all. The Moon simply has been hit by anything that comes from outer space unimpeded. The Earth has an atmosphere, so there is a problem with screening out some of the smaller objects, but the Earth also has a very active surface. We all know, I mean, this is why geology is geology, uh, that the Earth has plate tectonics, there's volcanism, there's erosion, there's a hydrological cycle, all these things, all these together conspire, more or less, to obliterate the impact record on Earth relatively rapidly. And so the Moon, which doesn't suffer any of these problems, there is no active lunar geological process going on right now, the Moon shows us how many impacts there are. So the Earth would look just like the Moon were it not for the geological activity on the Moon. In fact, there would be even slightly more impacts on the Earth than on the Moon because of the larger gravitational cross-section of the Earth. So the Earth attracts some bodies that would otherwise miss it because of its gravity. And so we have a fairly large number of impacts going on 
on the surface of the moon and the earth. Just on the earth, it doesn't last as long. They get covered up or they get eroded away or subducted or whatever else happens. So if we look at the surface of the moon, not only do we see heavily cratered areas in the so-called highlands, but we also see these regions here uh, that are called mare, and you probably noticed that they are mostly circular in shape and outline, and these are evidence for very large scale impacts that happened about 3.8 to 4 billion years ago in a time period that is commonly called the late heavy bombardment. There is still disagreement between scientists if this was kind of the last hooray of a long bombardment period or if there was actually a peak uh, in the impact flux at that time. There's evidence for both. I tend to more believe into the peak uh, hypothesis because the lunar rock record kind of points more in that direction. And there has been fairly recently also a model that shows us in terms of movement in the asteroid belt that could explain why there is actually a peak in the impact um, bombardment flux. Now, if we look a little closer on the moon, what you see is one impact crater basically overlapping another. There's impacts on top of impacts. The reason is you can even take some small lunar samples that have been brought back by the Apollo missions, and you'll see some of the crystals or some of the spheres, they are impacted by even smaller ones. And there's tiny, tiny microscopic impact craters on there. The reason is because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, even cosmic dust particles, very small micrometer-sized particles, hit the surface of the moon at very high velocities, and therefore it can cause impact craters. Small objects that would burn up in the atmosphere or are decelerated and fall on Earth like meteorites, of which you can see lots of in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, uh, they will hit the surface of the moon at cosmic velocities and therefore cause an impact crater. And we're talking about fairly high velocities, I'll come back to that a little bit later, which are many kilometers per second and therefore a lot of energy is involved. So the moon doesn't only show the small, but it also shows the large impact craters. But you will see that if you look at some of the, the larger craters, small craters are superimposed on top of it. So in fact, for an atmosphereless body like the moon, but also there are some others in the solar system, impact is the most important currently operating surface forming and surface modifying geological process that exists not on the Earth, but on planets and moons that have no atmospheres. That's a close-up of one particular crater called Timocharis, about 30 kilometers in diameter, and you see that there are secondary craters. You see all these kind of rays going away, which are composed of tiny little impacts of material that was thrown out during the formation of the larger feature. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite uh, photographs of the moon, not because it shows a particular spectacular crater. Uh, it's the Schubert B crater here with a nice central peak, but it also shows these white little dots everywhere, which are smaller impacts that happen later on. But if you look carefully here, you actually see a spacecraft here. This is uh, Apollo 16, the top part of the lunar module, coming back uh, to the mothership. Uh, and it uh, is a color photograph. And this is what people often don't realize. There's a little bit of color here in the spacecraft. The moon basically is black and white and only reflects uh, something like six or seven percent of the sunlight, so it's like dark coal. So that's an interesting aside. This is one of the uh, more recent larger impact craters on the moon. This is crater Copernicus with a diameter of almost 100 kilometers. And what you see here in the side view that is taken by uh, one of the earlier spacecraft orbiting the moon, you see that the crater rim is not just one single rim, elevated rim. In fact, it's a series of terraces that form during the formation of the crater in form of a collapse 
feature, and then in the center you see a series of hills that comprise the central uplift. Now, there are mentioned there are other objects in the solar system that are covered by impact craters, and of course one of the prime topics would be Mercury. Uh, here we have two very images, one for the mosaic on the left side that was taken in 1974 by the first spacecraft that went to Mercury, which is Mariner 10, and you see a very nicely cratered surface. And then a more recent one taken a few years ago by the MESSENGER spacecraft, which shows quite nicely what we have seen earlier on the Moon as well, that there are these craters that are kind of brighter and that show rays. Those are younger craters that expose material that is just below the surface, uh, which hasn't been subjected to space weathering yet, and therefore is not quite as dark. And this is why we see these younger craters uh, having rays quite nicely. Uh, if we go to Venus, the next planet in the solar system, if we go from the inside out, um, then Venus, as you probably know, is covered by a very dense atmosphere, uh, which doesn't allow us to see through to the surface. It has a density that is about 100 times as dense as the Earth atmosphere, and is composed by 96% of carbon dioxide, and makes a very nice greenhouse effect too. And therefore, the only way we, how we can see on the surface is by radar. And there have been a number of spacecraft that had radar equipment on board and made maps of the surface. And many hundred impact craters have been discovered, even though Venus, not quite like the Earth, but in a slightly different way, also has a very active geological surface. There's volcanism going on. There's probably been global outpouring of lava just a few hundred million years ago that resurfaced the planet and so on. The problem with the atmosphere of Venus is that most of the small objects don't make it through to the surface. They are caught up in the atmosphere, they're decelerated, they might explode in the atmosphere. And so only objects that make craters on the order of 10 kilometers and larger in diameter, really make it through to the surface. And when they do, the material that is thrown out from these craters doesn't travel quite as far. And this is what we see in this radar image. So you see a crater here. This is the crater rim here. And this is a material that is thrown out from that crater. A radar image shows surface roughness. This is the brighter parts or the brighter areas are more irregular surface than the uh, darker uh, areas. And so we see inside there's a central uplift and then there's a zone of melt rock. And here is kind of a blast zone around it which had to do with the uh, original impact and the blast wave that went out from there. Uh, if we look at craters, this is a family picture of a number of craters on Venus. The really small ones are not normal craters. They are like shrapnel hitting the surface because it's decelerated or broken to pieces. So only from about 10 kilometers oops, onwards do we find normal size, uh, normal shaped craters. Here is a large one, about 50 kilometers. In diameter, the largest one that has been identified on Venus is about 280 kilometers in diameter, which interestingly enough is approximately the same size of the largest crater that we have identified on Earth uh, as an eroded structure. Now we can compare uh, craters on Venus up here on the left with those on the Moon, for example, but also on Mars or on Ganymede, one of the satellites of uh, Jupiter. And you'll see that they are approximately the same size here, but they do show slightly different morphological features, which has to do with the type of surface that we see. Mars, uh, the first images that were ever beamed back from Mars, from a spacecraft, were in 1964. This was the Mariner 4 spacecraft, and they showed a cratered surface and nothing else. So people were a little disappointed. Later on, volcanoes were found, rift systems were found, and so on, that we see uh, here. But if we look closer, particularly the southern hemisphere, is covered by lots of impact craters that date back up to four million billion years uh, to the time of the late heavy bombardments. There are small craters like this one. This is just a 
400, 500 kil uh, meter diameter, fairly fresh crater, uh, up to large hundreds of kilometer size objects. This is one that's very interesting because here you have an older impact structure uh, that sits like an island in the stream here. Uh, there was obviously water movement going around the so-called rampart or ejecta part of that crater. Uh, we can observe the formation of young impact craters on Mars because of the spacecraft that are in orbit around Mars uh, that take pictures uh, every month or every few months. And so, for example, this is a new impact crater uh, in part of uh, southern part of Mars that was in a 2011 image, but not in a 2009 image. So it formed sometime in between relatively recently. And again, you see the very nice um, ray structures coming out of these young craters, which is something that disappears relatively rapidly afterwards. Uh, this is another area. Those are 75 meter wide images. And this is a time sequence that starts in the upper uh, left and continues over here and then ends in the lower right. This spans a period of 15 weeks. And here we see fresh impact craters that exposed subsurface ice. And you can see how that ice slowly disappears uh, and evaporates. And the only thing left over are these two young craters. So you can use impact craters for a variety of purposes. If we move further to the outer solar system, between Mars and Jupiter, we have to cross the asteroid belt, which is the source of most of the bodies that impact the inner planets. Um, and we see the asteroids. Here are two examples. The asteroid Matilde, with a diameter of about 50 kilometers, and the asteroid Eros, about 25, 30 kilometers long. And you see they're covered by impact craters as well, so evidence for collisional processes in the asteroid belt, of course, as well. And collisions are a very important uh, modifying feature there. Uh, this is kind of a family picture again of uh, most of the asteroids that have so far been visited by spacecraft. The largest one is uh, Lutetia with about 130 kilometers diameter. You see lots of craters. Some of them are more subdued, so they are older. Some of them are fresh and young. There you see uh, asteroid Ida, asteroid Eros, asteroid Matilda, asteroid Gaspra, and so on. The smallest one is a little, tiny little speck here, Itokawa. It's only uh, half a kilometer in diameter. It was visited by uh, a Japanese spacecraft. So there have been lots of uh, asteroids that have been visited, and they all show impact features. Uh, this is one that's uh, relatively new, these images. This shows on the left side a very interesting succession on the asteroid Vesta. It could be that there was a series of impacts that happened right one after the other from an object that had broken up and consisted of several pieces and therefore made these three kind of overlapping impacts. This is called the snowman feature for obvious reasons if you put it upside down. Uh, this is a relatively also young impact feature. Here you have the crater rim of an older crater and on the slope of that crater rim another impact happened and you see that some of the ejecta went only in one direction down slope. So that tells you something about the direction from which the impact happened. If we go uh, in the outer solar systems, the planets out there don't have solid surfaces. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are known as the gas and ice giants. So they don't have a solid surface, but their moons do, and the moons record impact processes. Here are the four large Galilean satellites. Uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa, uh, ordered in, uh, by their size. Europa uh, and, uh, and, and Io are very relatively active.
bodies, especially Io, uh, is dominated by volcanoes, but the others do record some impact events. For example, Callisto, here a very large impact basin, several hundred kilometers in diameter, multi-ring feature, or crater chains, uh, again a body that had broken up and where the different bits impacted one after the other. Uh, on, on Ganymede here, uh, or uh, an older impact structure on the icy surface of the moon Europa, broken by two pairs of later uh, fractures that relate to the ice tectonics on the surface of Europa, but you can very clearly see the interesting feature, which doesn't look like a crater on the moon that we've just seen, which has to do with the ice on that surface, because we have ice that relaxes after some time, it fills in, there's probably an ocean underneath, so water might seep up there and fill in the structure, and this is why impact structures on different bodies don't always look identical. Um, here we have uh, on the upper left another uh, image from Europa, you see the various parts of ice tectonic, and here you actually see two younger impacts that happened on top of a fracture zone. So the ice, uh, the, the, the ocean probably moves, it's kind of similar to uh, some of the um, large-scale ice shields in Antarctica, the, the marine ice shields, not the continental ones. So they move a little bit, there's fractures going on, there's different displacements, and then bam, two impacts happen on top of that. If we go to Saturn, there are three moons that I just pulled out here, I could show all of them. All of them show impact craters. Phoebe, one of the outer uh, moons, totally covered by impacts similar to an asteroid. Uh, Mimas, a moon that's about 500 kilometers in diameter, is dominated by one large impact feature, and many, many small ones, but that one large one, a crater called Herschel, and has a diameter of about 130 kilometers. Had it been just a little bit larger, that impact, it would have broken that moon apart. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. And even the largest moon in the Saturn system, the approximately 5,200 kilometer diameter Titan, uh, which is the only moon that has an atmosphere, by the way, which is composed of nitrogen and methane, and there is a hydrologic cycle going on, on the surface, um, not with water, but with methane. Uh, even that one, this is a radar image, just like the one from Venus, because we can't see so well through the atmosphere, shows a good number of impact structures. So, we have been through the solar system, we've seen lots of objects, lots of them are dominated by impact craters. On the Earth, as I said, it's not quite as easy, because the Earth, um, the geological processes on the Earth quite rapidly obliterate the impact cratering record. So to date, a bit over 180 impact structures have been definitely identified on Earth. And I'll tell you a little bit later about by which criteria we identify these impact craters. It's not as easy as taking these by now, I have to say, very ubiquitous and quite cumbersome Google Earth images where people see circles. You know, that happens all the time. I get not one week passes by that somebody sends me some Google Earth image and says, there's an impact crater on there. And no, it's not that easy. You, know, you can do that on the moon. Most circular features will be impacts, not on Earth. There's many other geological processes that can form circular features, and we'll kind of talk about that in a moment. First, I want to show you some examples of meteorite craters on Earth, impact craters on Earth. The first one, of course, is the eponymous Meteor Crater in Arizona. Uh, this has a diameter of about 1.2 kilometers. It's about 250 meters deep, relatively young. It formed just 50,000 years ago. And uh, it was very important for our uh, understanding of impact craters in general because it was only in the first part of the 20th century that this was identified as an impact crater, and as science goes, of course, not everybody believed it. Some people thought it was a volcanic feature, but slowly 
by work that started uh, by a mining engineer, Daniel Beringer, uh, around 1906. Uh, that laid the foundations of accepting that this feature is, in fact, uh, an impact crater. Just a little historical side note. A little bit earlier, meteorites were actually found just around this structure, not inside, but around the structure. Iron meteorites, small pieces, millimeter, centimeter sized pieces, up to about pieces that are about the size of a, 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 of a suitcase or something like that. And interestingly enough, they were found um, in a circular distribution around this crater, yet nobody made the connection, except bearing a little later, that the crater had something to do with the distribution of meteorites. They named the meteorites after this tiny little canyon up there uh, that is in the corner up on the, on the right. They're called the Canyon Diablo meteorites. So if you ever see a Canyon Diablo meteorite in a collection somewhere, it actually came from Meteor Crater. And um, even though people were studying this, nobody really made the connection until Beringer, he said, oh, it's clear, it has to come from the structure. Now, he made another mistake, and you know, he didn't know any better at that time. He thought if there's lots of small meteorites around, in fact, the large one that made the crater must still be under the crater floor, and he thought there would be uh, a meteorite that's many hundred meters in diameter, and that he could mine out, and they contain lots of rare metals, and that way he would recoup his expenses, basically, and even get rich. Well, it didn't turn out that way, and I'll show you a little bit later why. But this is kind of how the whole thing started. Now let's go and see some others. This is a good example of what happens to meteorite craters on Earth. Um, the top one is the 50,000-year-old meteor crater in Arizona. The lower one is about uh, five, eight times as old as that one, Tenomere in Mauritania. And you can see that the crater rim is already not quite as sharp anymore. Uh, and it's filled mostly by sand. And so relatively rapidly, uh, these things start disappearing on Earth. This is another example. This is the four million year old Rotakam crater in Namibia, about two and a half kilometers in diameter. And you barely see the crater rim. There is hardly any outcrop. I spent several weeks of field work there. Um, and there's just a few little spots along the crater rim that are not covered by sand or not subject to erosion yet. So hardly anything left. If we wait another few million years, maybe 10 million years, it will be totally invisible uh, like this and only very specialized geological studies will allow us to see them. And this is the problem. What is a few million years in Earth history? Nothing. So relatively quickly, these things start disappearing. Another small crater, Wolf Creek in Australia, also very young. Uh, the Tsvang or Salt Pen crater in uh, South Africa near Pretoria. This is five times as old, only 250,000 years old as Meteor Crater. And it sits in a temperate climate and so therefore is subject to intense erosion. And what do we see? The crater rim is already rounded and there is no outcrop inside the crater that would allow us to identify this immediately as an impact crater. And this is why many of the researchers in Southern Africa have thought this is a volcanic feature. We had to drill down, it happened in the early 90s, 200 meters here in the central part of the crater, actually from this tiny little spot right here, and only below 100 meters below the surface were rocks that carried the evidence that this was an impact. So if you would go there as a geologist and says, I want to see if this is a meteorite crater, you have no geological evidence on the surface. And this is a young feature, a quarter of a million years old. Very, very quickly do they disappear. This is the same structure at a different water level. Um, it just shows you how difficult, you almost have difficulty recognizing where the crater rim is. I mean, there's some roads and paths going there, but the crater rim down here, it's very difficult to see already. This is a meteor crater from space. This shows you, by the way, this uh, Canyon Diablo here. And the meteorites <laughs> were found around here, this crater. Nevertheless, they named them after this canyon. Um, this is another small crater, Amgid in Algeria, or Lonar in India, 
or BP, uh, named after you know who, uh, in uh, Libya. These days, not easy to get to. I was lucky to spend uh, two weeks there doing field work at a time when it was still easier. Bozumtwi crater in Ghana, the probably youngest complex impact crater that is preserved on Earth. Most space shuttle photographs and satellite photographs look like this because it's in the equatorial region. There's almost always clouds. This is a rare Lancet image. In fact, there is a central peak hidden underneath the lake water. It's a very well-preserved crater. Uh, it's large enough. Oops, this one. Uh, is another interesting structure, 3.6 million years old, 18 kilometers in diameter in Russia. El Gigitkin, the crater rim, is here. There is an eccentrically located uh, crater lake that also hides a lot of the material that is inside. Now we go back in age and also maybe go back, go up a little bit in size. 18 kilometer diameter Arunga crater in Chad. You can already see very deeply eroded. We don't know the exact age. It's probably on the order of 60 to 80 million years. Or the Granifada structure in Chad. Um, this is a nice one, easily recognizable. It's also a younger one, just a few million years old. New Quebec in Canada uh, in winter and in summer. Um, this is a more eroded one, 13 kilometer one, deep bay. Uh, can say it's a lake, but what would make you think that this is an impact crater, uh, except that it's kind of circular, but as I said, that's not the only criterion. We'll come back later. Uh, double impact, 200 million years approximately old. Uh, in Canada, uh, Clearwater East and Clearwater West, very deeply eroded already or also the Manicouagan structure in Canada, 214 million years old, which was originally about 100 kilometers in diameter. And don't you think this is the 100 kilometer diameter structure? No, no. The original crater was somewhere out here. And the only thing that hints at the structure is there's a little bit discoloration which has to do with the hydrological path of creeks. This is the central uplift, and you only see it well because Hydro-Quebec built a dam here that dammed the whole thing up. Otherwise, it might look like this. Isn't that circular too? No. But this is the problem with Google Earth images. People see circles everywhere, and they <laughs> have nothing to do with impacts. Um, we go to more deeply eroded structures. This is the uh, 145 million year old Gosses Bluff. And you might be forgiven to think that this is the crater. No, it's not. This was the crater before erosion. We have lost hundreds of meters of surface material through erosion. This was about 24 kilometers in diameter before erosion. This is the eroded part of the central uplift, where even here the interior has already been eroded out. Um, where is the crater here? Geophysicists from measurements and field work would identify it as somewhere around here. Okay. 580 million years old. Um, this is also very old in the billion year range. This is the spider structure in Australia, the original crater, somewhere out here. Um, Teague in Australia, again, this is just what is left of the central uplift, and even that is deeply eroded. the original crater, much larger than that. Fredefort, the largest impact structure preserved on Earth, or the remnant of the largest impact crater preserved on Earth, originally about 300 kilometers in diameter. What is left is a little more than a third of the arc of the deeply eroded central uplift with about 70 kilometers in diameter. This structure is two billion years old. It's also the oldest impact structure of which we have any crater remnant on Earth. We have lost approximately 10 kilometers of surface material due to erosion, so we're at the very bottom of this impact structure. And this is what this diagram is also supposed to illustrate here. 
We have, generally on Earth, two different crater forms. We have the smaller bowl-shaped craters, simple craters, a simple bowl here like uh, uh, Wolf Creek up here. Or then we have complex craters like uh, Goss's Bluff. And what you need to imagine is this would be a fresh crater. It has a central uplift. It has brecciated material and melt rock that fills in that uh, moat, that crater moat. And here we have the crater rim also with ejected material. And imagine erosion starts like big sandpaper taking off the surface and you go down, 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 down. First you get rid of the crater rim, then you get rid of the filling, and then you're down here at the bottom somewhere. And all you have left is the central uplift, which is disturbed rocks that come from deeper down. So this is what we see here. The central part has also been eaten up by erosion. This rest you only see because there's fracture zones that go deeper down, which cause a different hydrological pattern that is circularly shaped. So we're deep down here in all these cases. And this is what we have to contend with on Earth. And this is why the identification of these structures is not quite as easy. So here we have impact craters on Earth. The distribution, uh, you see that some areas seem to have more than others. This is not because they form more often in certain places, but because they're better preserved in these places. So, for example, here we have the Southern African or the Australian or the Baltic or the Canadian shield areas, which are very old continental surfaces. The ocean floor, as we all know, is very, very young compared to uh, the continental crust. There is no ocean floor that's older than about 200 million years. And most ocean floor is a lot younger than that. And so impact craters don't happen quite as often anymore, at least, that there would be many on the ocean floor. And also, if a smaller impact happens in the ocean, you have a big splash, and that was it. Uh, it has to be something that penetrates actually through to the ocean floor, which on average, the oceans are four kilometers deep. So you need large objects, and they just don't happen quite as often. So about one-third of these impact craters we have identified so far on Earth are not even exposed on the Earth's surface and are only accessible through geophysical measurements or drilling. But this helps us to get a nice 3D picture of these images. Now, let me briefly in a cartoon show what happens during such an impact and this is why uh, Beringer, coming back to him, uh, didn't find his big meteorite at the bottom of Meteor Crater. This is because we have, oops, sorry, we have a relatively small object that simply hits the ground at extremely high velocities, cosmic velocities. On Earth, these velocities, for celestial mechanical reasons, range between about 10 and 70 kilometers per second. So on average, one of these impacts happens at maybe 20, 30 kilometer per second. So E equals, not mc squared, but one half of the mass times the velocity squared to get the kinetic energy, and you can calculate how much energy is actually involved in these things. So it penetrates a little bit into the ground, uh, creates shock waves that run into the ground that lead to irreversible changes in the mineral structure of lots of minerals and crystals. And this is what we then use for identifying impacts. I'll come to that in a moment. And then uh, a reaffection wave runs back to the surface, excavates the crater, the mass flow starts, and we're finished with a crater like this. And the two main take-home messages is, a very small object makes a relatively large crater. The ratio is about 1 to 15 to 1 to 20. So one kilometer object will make a 20 kilometer diameter crater. Rule of thumb. And the second thing is this whole thing happens in a few seconds, maybe a minute at most. So they are short-term, violent geological processes. Where's all the material coming from? We know the orbits of about 600,000 asteroids currently between Mars and uh, Jupiter, and about 25,000 of these asteroids are on Earth crossing or Earth approaching orbits. And we see here a small subset of those, the ones that are larger than one kilometer in diameter, 
we know the orbits of most that are small, that are larger than half a kilometer in diameter, but not many that are smaller because they're very difficult to detect. So we are sitting here with uh, the inner solar system and the orbit of Earth in the middle of a cosmic shooting gallery. Eventually, one of these things will hit Earth. Now, to the criteria. I've already mentioned that morphology, such as a circular outline, but also geophysical information, such as gravity anomaly, magnetic anomalies, are interesting hints at craters, but they cannot provide confirming evidence. So we need something else that helps us on Earth to confirm that we're looking not at a volcanic caldera, at a karst collapse feature, at a wind-blown aeolian feature, whatever else there is. Um, and they all might have magnetic or gravity anomalies, right? Uh, but gravity anomaly is not, is, doesn't come with a label and says, this is a gravity anomaly caused by an impact. No. Gravity anomaly is gravity anomaly, and you have to figure out the cause. So, what we really need is we really need to look at the rocks in detail. So we need to do mineralogical and geochemical studies of these rocks. And the two main criteria are the presence of shock metamorphism. This happens when that impact occurs and it creates a shock wave in the ground. It leads to changes in the mineral structures. And the second thing is there might be a little bit of a trace of a meteoritic material. If the meteorites are not left because they're weathered away, maybe there's a little bit of their chemical uh, salt, so to say, added on to the terrestrial rocks and we can uh, tease this apart and indeed this is the case. Now, large-scale evidence of shock metamorphism is rare. The only one uh, are the so-called shatter cones, of which you see an example here. This is about a 20 centimeter size object. And you see this nice horse tailing here, very characteristic for shatter cones. Disclaimer, however, there's many other features that to the untrained eye can look very similar. There is cone and cone structures, there's concussion features and other things. And again, I get samples sent with a few scratches on them and people say these are shatter cones. No, no, no. This is how shatter cones look like. They're very characteristic once you've seen them before. We can also look at brecciated rocks that tend to fill impact craters. And we look in detail and we see that there's, for example, some glassy inclusions. But also if we zoom in uh, on the crystal level and we, for example, look at quartz crystals, then what we see a typical quartz crystal, this is about an 80 or so micrometer sized quartz crystal, and you see it has these lamellae that crisscross it. These are called planar deformation features, and they are the uniquely characteristic evidence that we're looking at something that was created by impact. The only other process on Earth that has ever created those are very large atomic bomb explosions, because we're looking also at shock waves that hit the rocks. So, but we don't have cosmic atomic bomb explosions, we have similar things that pack a lot of energy too, and they make these lamellae. And if we look at the crystal in 3D, we actually see that there are planes that go through the whole crystal, and there are long crystallographic preferred orientations, and the orientations that we can measure under the optical microscope with a thing called the universal stage can help us understand the shock pressure and so on. The second line of evidence is the presence of a meteoritic component in these breaches and melt rocks. Basically, very, very simple is, uh, there are chemical elements that have significantly different abundances and isotopic compositions in meteorites compared to the terrestrial rocks, surface rocks. And if we add just a little bit of that extraterrestrial material, for example, the platinum group elements. It will totally change the composition in terms of abundance and isotopic composition of the resulting mixture, even if we only add a tiny little bit. You can compare that if you have a huge pot of water and you add a little bit of salt. You'll find that salt, even though mass-wise it is hundreds of a percent maybe, and this is what we're looking at here as well. So we're looking at siderophile element abundances, platinum group element inter-element ratios, and the isotopic abundances, for example, of the elements osmium or chromium. One of the best places, and the one that was really taken as evidence, 
was the KT boundary, now called the KPG boundary at the end of the Cretaceous. And in this nicely labeled section, there are the Cretaceous rocks, there are the tertiary rocks, there's this thin layer in between that later was found to contain huge abundances of the element iridium, for example, and also shocked quartz, so there was evidence for an impact uh, and we now know where it is. It's the Chicxulub impact structure. There's, by the way, currently a drilling project going on, IODP, ICDP. Tomorrow night there is a town hall meeting, so maybe you hear more about that. Anyway, I don't have time to go into this. This is what might have happened 65 million years ago. And this is the way how we look at, for example, osmium isotopes in a diagram that plots rhenium versus osmium isotopes. And we see that all the meteorites and the impact branches pl plot on one side, and the target rocks in this diagram plot somewhere else. And this is what helps us geochemists understand that there is actually uh, an impact component. Another one would be the element chromium. There's an isotopic anomaly as well. All terrestrial rocks plot on a zero kind of uh, reference line. Certain meteorites plot to the left, other meteorites plot to the right, and there is craters, and it tells us which composition even we were looking at here. So this is what geochemists do, this is one of the lines of work that I do, uh, and what I'm trying to convey, it's not quite as easy as looking as a Google Earth image. You need to do a lot of specialized work afterwards, and people need to have the expertise. I'm getting close to finishing here. I just want to point out that the early Earth, again, was dominated by impacts. We have a lot of evidence for that. But that impacts occur permanently over the geological record. And this is a diagram uh, that has been constructed from both astronomical observations but also geological observations on Earth that tell us how often do things happen. So something like Meteor Crater, maybe every few hundred to thousand years, something the size of Buzumtwi, about 10 kilometers in diameter, maybe every uh, few hundred thousand years, but something fortunately as large as the Chicxulub KT boundary impact, only every few 50 to 100 million years. Even smaller objects that don't quite make it to the surface of the Earth can have devastating consequences. One example was, uh, approximately 50 meters in diameter, 10 megaton TNT equivalent. Uh, let me just point out that the Hiroshima atomic bomb had 15 kiloton TNT equivalent, so very much smaller. So a 10 megaton TNT equivalent, which is a 50 meter diameter object, exploded in 1908 over the Russian uh, forests. Had it exploded over uh, New York City, here you have New York City, there is Manhattan, and this was the region of destruction. So 2,000 square kilometers. So even small things have devastating consequences. Um, spy satellites can have an interesting side use. They detect also explosions in the atmosphere of small asteroids, and here you have from the time period of 1994 to 2013, so it's just not even 20 years, all the explosions that happened in the Earth atmosphere, mostly at 50 to 100 kilometers altitude, some of them lower down. For example, this one here. This is an interesting one. What happened there in 2013, Chelyabinsk, a 20 meter, or maybe 17 meter, we're not quite sure, but a small object, exploded in about 25 kilometers altitude in a city that was 70 or 60 kilometers away as the crow flies, there was destruction. Most windows were blown out, walls collapsed, uh, things were destroyed, 1,500 people had to go to the hospital, etc., etc. So even in this case, when the only thing that reaches the surface is an atmospheric blast wave, this was 30 times the power of the Hiroshima bomb, we have devastating consequences. Other planets are not immune to that either. In 1994, a comet that broke up uh, into different pieces impacted one after the other on Jupiter. Now let's remember, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It doesn't have a solid surface, nevertheless. 
it showed these impact scars that lasted in the atmosphere for a long, long time. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, these little objects that you know, hit here are about kilometer size, so not very large. And they made a fairly large impact scar. And if we want to compare the size of the Earth, uh, so those are small things, and they can happen all the time. So to conclude, impact structures are unique geological features on the Earth. They allow us to study a short time, violent process that is very important in shaping the surfaces of almost all planets in our solar system. Drilling is crucial to understand their three-dimensional structure and the understanding the craters forms our basis of understanding one uh, natural hazard that uh, we really don't know too much about. And that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>